Thank you very much. I'm Thilo Jung, and this is Young and Naive. And Young and Naive uh, means we're going to address each other in our by first, uh, names. by first names, in our informal. You can way. say you to me, <laughs> Alex Thilo. Um, and we're going to do this in English since there are a lot of English speakers in our audience. But I'm sure still many people don't even know you. So let's talk about you first. Um, how did you get into politics? Uh, it's a bit of a family disease. <laughs> yeah, my, my father was a diplomat and was a journalist before that. Uh, my uncle was a politician himself. And so I grew up uh, uh, in a political family. And then I also grew up in a very political age. Uh, late uh, uh, 70s, early 80s, I, I, I sort of evolved, developed a, a political consciousness, and uh, that was the time when my parents were moved to Moscow because as a diplomat, he served at, my father served at the German embassy there. And so from the comfort of Western Germany, I could see the other side of the Iron Curtain as a teenager. And that politicizes everyone, I believe. Did you go to Moscow as well? Yes, of course. Well, I didn't live there, but I went like three, four times each year. What, what did you learn about the Soviet Union back then? Um, was it as bad as the propaganda made it sound? Yeah, my father was the cultural attaché. Let, I mean, let's keep in mind I was 16 at the time. And, 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 and he was in touch with artists who were part of the official artists' associations, who didn't have any problems, who had exhibitions, etc. But he was also in touch, of course, with uh, artists, painters, authors, musicians who weren't. And these people were followed around by the KGB. They, they unplugged their telephone and put on music before they would speak freely. They were, they were listened in, in their own homes. And so this lack of freedom, this oppressive atmosphere, this, this also lack of, of, of material wealth, which strikes a West German teenager, of course, as, as, as rather, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's quite dramatic when you see it. All of that struck me. And so when you ask, was it as bad as it was made out to be? The social economic system, the political system, yes, the people were wonderful. The Russians were wonderful, warm-hearted, uh, uh, open, intelligent. Uh, the culture was amazing. Uh, we went to see churches and, and, and uh, concerts and everything. So it was a very differentiated image that I came away with. But on the political level, I was very clear that when I left school, that I knew what I was doing when I was joined, joining the German Armed Forces. Uh, I never considered Kriegsdienstverweigerung, you know, conscientious uh, objection, because I knew I didn't want to live in a system like the one that uh, was represented by the Soviet Union. Tell me about your days in the German army. Oh, well, well that was 85 to 87. Uh, I would say medium exciting. Um, what, uh, what did you do? Uh, armored reconnaissance. So I was a tank commander uh, and a platoon commander. Um, uh, our, there's two kinds of reconnaissance. One is you drive very far out and you just look. And the other kind of reconnaissance is you shoot. Then you go there and see whether you hit what you were shooting at. And then you look. And that was my job. Why didn't you stay with the Bundeswehr? I mean, you, you, you could have decided, okay, I'm going to uh, be an officer, going to become a general. My, my uncle would be proud. I wasn't so much the soldier type. I, um, you know, I had spent two years there, did the officer training program, reserve officer program, liked that. But I wasn't, it wasn't my life. It was not my lifestyle. I wanted to do something else and ended up doing something else. Did your worldview when it comes to militarism change when you were a soldier? No. Uh, militarism is uh, um, sort of exaggerating the military virtues um, and applying them to civilian life. That was not the situation in the Federal Republic. On the contrary, for example, I could go home every weekend. If you're a conscript, if you were a conscript in the Red Army at the time, you couldn't go home for two years. Uh, so militarism was really not an issue. Uh, I think it's not an issue to this day, at least not in Germany. So how did your political worldview come about? I mean, did you just inherit the world worldview of your dad and your uncle and your family? Because they were all uh, FDP members. Yeah, yeah my, my uncle was a rather prominent FDP politician, you're right. right. right, right. Um, but, well, I mean, when you grew up in the 70s mm -hmm. and 80s, why didn't you uh, join the Greens, for example? Since you were a young guy. Yeah. 
um, because the Greens had no clue what was going on behind the Iron Curtain and had the slogan Lieber Rot als Tod, rather red than dead. And I knew that red was not an option for me. So um, on economic, so the Greens were not an option. This was the time, of course, of the dual track decision in NATO, NATO Doppelbeschluss. Um, and I felt that what, what, that what, what, what the political left outside of Parliament, Greens, the peace movement, inside of Parliament, the Social Democrats did to Helmut Schmidt, was mistaken. I thought it was a mistaken policy that they were following. I thought Schmidt was right in implementing uh, um, the dual track decision. And on the right, CDU at the time was did not recognize the oder Neisse border, was uh, very much in bed with the Vertriebenenverbände, the, 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 the expelled uh, uh, associations here. And you had this harboring, this, this, this lingering feeling of, well, they want to get back Silesia and Pomerania and Eastern Prussia. And to me, that seemed a little bit unrealistic. And also, at the time, the conservatives were still very homophobic. And so, at the end of the day, I felt myself very much at home in the liberal family, um, tolerant, open market economy and, and with a reasonable foreign policy. And to this day, I feel at home there. Were the FDP, were they as neoliberal as they were later on? Well, <laughs> neoliberal is a uh, term that has been has changed its meaning. Um, neoliberal originally meant you tame sort of the, the excesses of, of capitalism by providing a, a, a framework within which capitalism plays out. Uh, neoliberal, as we use it today, describes the excesses of capitalism, which is the exact opposite of what it was meant to be. So at the time it was neoliberal, but in the old sense. Um, and uh, today I think we still are, we believe in the cartel and we, we believe in, 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 in fair rules for competition, we believe in the level playing field, so that's I think... Uh, Minimum wage? Well, the minimum wage, I think, uh, theoretically is a bad project because if, you, if, if it's too low, it has no effect. And if it's too high, it prices a lot of people out of the market. What we see in Germany right now, and you'll be surprised, is a minimum wage that hardly has any effect because it, 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 it doesn't change much. Um, and, and we still have working poor in Germany. We have people who uh, work but uh, can't make a living. And so you, we would need a higher minimum wage. If you use the instrument of a minimum wage, as we do in Germany right now, it probably would have to be higher than it is today. So you are in favor of a higher minimum wage? Well, as a politician, as a politician, I said we should not have a minimum wage that's administered by politicians. Because what you see is a competition among various political parties to raise the minimum wage. Now, the socialists say we should have it at 12 euros. Well, you can debate that. But if the politicians then decide, let's have it at 12 euros, come the next election, the competition is going to be for 15. Come the next election, it's going to be for 20. It's and good. eventually... Isn't that good? No, it's not good because you price a lot of people out of the market who will be unemployed, who will not have a job because their productivity doesn't match their cost. But... It, it, Do you think uh, it should be at least like 12 euros so anybody who works their entire life for a minimum wage can at least have uh, a better, um, how do you say, pension than someone who didn't work at all? I, um, I'm quite happy that we gave it into a commission of experts who determined this. And um, I'm, I, I, what I really want to see is that system working. So as a member of the Bundestag, I will not give you a figure. I will not say 11.50, 12.50, 12 because that's exactly the kind of competition uh, uh, that we enter into that I don't want to enter into. Let's have the uh, experts do it. Traditionally, what we had was the trade unions and the employers' associations hammer out uh, wages that were then applied more or less universally. I think that's the better system. So what is your political worldview? How would you describe it? Well, I'm a liberal. Uh, I'm a German and a European. I want a, a successful European Union. I'm, I, I think very much in European terms. I've served in the European Parliament for 13 years and have arrived here only two years ago in Berlin. I want an open and tolerant society. I want uh, a, a country that is governed by the rule of law. 
Um, I want, for example, to give you one example, people uh, have just said that they don't trust our, the way our government works, our, our, our system of governance works any longer. And a big part of that is that our courts don't work properly. But I think for a party like the Liberal Party that is very much focused on the rule of law, we need to improve our judicial system. We need to make the courts work again. We need to, make we need to give people the trust that when they turn to a court of law, that they will be heard and that they will get a decision in an appropriate appropriate amount of time. Today you have civil proceedings that take five to seven years. To, to me that's really, really crucial. It's the interface between the state and the citizen. It's in schools. We need to improve our schools. It's in courts. It's on, on taxation. All of these issues. I believe that the state should be there to serve the citizen and not consider the citizen somebody who serves the state. Should the state also be there to uh, protect the citizens, citizens from enterprises, for example? Absolutely. That's what I meant when I said I want a level playing field for competition. If you have uh, uh, big companies, big business, who can uh, uh, impose uh, um, prices and who can impose conditions on, on, on the market and, and do so in an unfair manner, uh, that's uh, the role of the state to step in and stop that. What's the difference between liberal or being liberal and neoliberalism? shouldn't be so hard to differentiate, right? Well, as I said, uh, the word neoliberal as it's used today describes an excessive, an untamed version of capitalism. That's not the liberal uh, view of competition in the market economy. So the central difference is, if you use neoliberal in the contemporary way, um, that's not uh, the social market economy that we think of. We want a market economy in which everybody has a fair chance of succeeding, new market entrants as well, incumbents as well, but nobody's allowed to abuse their market power. New liberal, as you use it now, describes a system in which uh, companies are allowed to uh, abuse their market power and in which in particularly the financial services industry is completely unregulated. That's you, not my view of uh, the social market economy. Do you remember the, the first neoliberal paper that was introduced in German politics by your uncle, the Lambsdorff paper? Oh, no, that was a paper to restore competitiveness to the German economy who had just been struck by two major oil crises in the early 80s. Like in the, in the uh, political science, it is the birth of German neoliberalism. Yeah, don't believe everything the scientists write. <laughs> At least not in political science. <laughs> so how, how did you become like a foreign... Uh, politician, like foreign policy politician? Well, I mean, I'm a historian by training mm -hmm. and a diplomat by profession. So um, I, I, I wasn't a politician all my life. I actually had a real job uh, first um, and a decent one too. <laughs> Which one? I was a diplomat. I was, um, uh, I passed the exam to enter the uh, foreign service and there's somebody whom I did it together with was Rainer. Uh, yeah, we, we, we were trained together, and we went to school together too, so that's a different matter. Um, and uh, so for 10 years I served as a diplomat in the Foreign Office, and then in 2004 uh, we had European elections coming up, and I asked my local party chapter, listen guys, uh, we have the European elections coming up, uh, who's going to be our candidate? They looked around, and then they looked at me. And that's how I was picked to run. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it, that's the way it was. Uh, uh, um, Re they really, said, you, you were like, so who's running? And then yeah, the I mean, you have to know that the, the me? FDP, the FDP, was not in the European Parliament from '94 to 2004. In the 2003, I literally asked our party manager in Nordrhein-Westfalen to be very precise who's going to be the lead candidate for the European elections. And literally, his answer was, "Oh yes, we have European elections." because we didn't have European uh, members of parliament. And then he, he looked at me and said, would you be interested? And I said, that's why I'm asking. Um, and so, you know, the discussion went on and on and on, and then there was a competition. Somebody else wanted to do it too. And we went around all the districts of Nordrhein-Westfalen, and, and uh, then the delegates decided, and that's how I became a politician. So you had to quit your job at the foreign office? Yeah. I did. Was it hard? I liked what I did. I was the, uh, an analyst for Russian foreign policy. I was the desk officer of Ru Russian foreign policy when I left. Referat 205. Um, in the early 2000s, right? And that was in the early 2000s. When, when like Putin was a friend of ours, when he spoke the in the Bundestag. The situation was slightly better than it is today, yes. Slightly better. Uh, actually, it was a lot better. Um, but still, it wasn't easy. 
uh, it was a time when the uh, Russian Federation had just was, was in the process of developing this ideology of Roskimir, the Russian world, and was exerting an enormous amount of pressure on uh, um, Estonia and Latvia. And, and this was my neighboring unit. I was in the Russia unit and there was the Baltic unit. And we had constant discussions about you know, how to address the situation that the Baltics who were on their way into the European Union and into NATO, uh, uh, how we should deal with this, this tension. So it wasn't all easy, but it was a very interesting job and I didn't quit my job because I didn't like it. On the contrary, I loved it and I loved what I did afterwards too. Were you in favor that Estonia and Latvia join NATO? Because they are like at the border of Russia and the Russians were promised that NATO would not expand after the wall fell? No, they weren't promised that. Um, That's what Gorbachev says. Yes, but uh, he, no, they weren't promised that. <laughs> they were promised one particular thing, two particular things. One is there was not going to be NATO installations in uh, permanent major NATO installations east of Germany. That's, that's what, what like right now? No, there aren't. If you look, you will not find a singular, significant, big NATO installation east of Germany. Well, they call it permanent rotation. Yeah, the, the rotation, it's but the, the rotation, no, it's not the same. Uh, it's, it's really not the same. And... I was very much in favor of, of, of Estonia and Latvia being allowed to join NATO because I'm a big believer in, in, in the freedom of a nation to choose its alliances freely. And when Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania said, we want to join NATO, um, I, I was very much in favor of that. Poland did, so, so essentially all of, all of Central Europe uh, did more or less. And uh, I have to say that before I joined the Foreign Office, I spent a few months in Tallinn uh, working together with our liberal sister party there that was just being formed and they were clearly determined to join Euro-Atlantic organizations and I was very much supporting that. So could you imagine what happened uh, the next 10 or 15 years in Russia, with Russia, or were you as uh, optimistic when it came to German-Russian relation, Western-Russian relation? I was hoping for a more cooperative Russia. Um, Why? Because the 90s were a decade of, of internal turmoil in Russia, but they were also a decade under which, when we were following what I would call the democratization paradigm. Our approach to Russia was that eventually Russia was going to sort of become more like Western democracies, rule of law, social market economy, democracy, etc., etc., um, but that didn't play out. And so we now are in a different situation, which I regret very much that we have this, this very tense relationship with Russia. Um, but the hope at the time was a different one. But why didn't it work out? Well, I think that um, there was a number of factors uh, uh, why it didn't work out. Uh, particularly that... Um, <sighs> Russia's stance towards its neighbors began to become difficult already in the very, very early 90s. Not entirely their fault, but Abkhazia was, was, was a harbinger of what came later in Transnistria, um, that, that the Russians were not respecting the territorial sovereignty of what they then termed the near abroad. So they had a different notion of uh, sovereignty. Um, Russia was sovereign, other nations were sovereign, but the countries that used to make up the Soviet Union did not, in Moscow's view, enjoy full sovereignty. They had to ask for permission to do this or that before doing this or that. That was, of course, incompatible with the Charter of Paris that Russia signed. And uh, so over time, uh, Russia became less and less uh, cooperative. Internally, um, the position hardened. It was ever more difficult for um, the democratic opposition to have uh, a space with which to work, in which to work. And so it's, it's, it's the domestic development and the foreign policy developments that culminated essentially in 2014. Does Putin have a point when, when it comes to Western relations? Like, which part of the Russian perspective do you understand and agree with? I understand the Russian uh, point of view that they want to be taken seriously. I believe that, for example, saying that Russia is a regional power as Barack Obama did, is a capital mistake. Uh, Russia is a, a world power. 
Russia has a permanent seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. Russia has a significant nuclear force. Russia is the largest country on Earth with 11 time zones. People don't understand the dimensions, 11 time zones. All of Europe has like three or four. Um, and, and so sometimes I think the Russians felt uh, uh, they were not being taken seriously. And also there was, there was a time of what I would term in, in Alan Greenspan's word, uh, irrational exuberance on the part of some people in Washington, D.C., who felt there was something like a unilateral moment when the United States were the only country that really could determine how the world was going to evolve. And um, so the Russians felt snubbed, and I have a certain degree of sympathy with, with, with that kind of feeling. And what can we do to change um, current relations? Keep talking. I've, I've just, I just come back from Moscow. Uh, it's not easy these days because what we call a dialogue sometimes appears to be serial monologues. We say something, they say something, we say something, they say something, but we don't actually talk to one another. We just speak, you know, sequentially. Um, so we, we need to keep talking. Uh, we need to uh, hope um, that uh, Russia will come to a point where it accepts that, for example, Ukraine is allowed to sign an agreement with the European Union because it's Ukraine's sovereign choice to do so. Um, and uh, I hope also that Russia will eventually see that it, it has to uh, uh, um, step down its, its violence in eastern Ukraine. Um, we're making, I hope that there will be some progress at the Minsk meeting in December in Paris. Um, so a number of, of things where Russia needs to step down. But I think we are f we're not at that point yet. Uh, if you look, think of the Valdai conference that happened like two years ago, where the motto was, the Valdai club is like a Russian BFR. It's like a Russian Kerber thing, except that the president hosts it and is there. And so Valdai is the, the, the point where, where, where you have this, these, these debates. And there was this, 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 this title to the entire meeting was new rules or no rules? And then you ask yourself, okay, which are the rules that Russia wants? Because we, we can't simply do away with international law. We can't simply do away with, with, with the basic tenets of, of interna the international system. What are the rules that Russia wants? And nobody in Russia is able to answer that question. Because at the end of the day, they're very much in favor of multilateralism because it gives them a big lever to, to influence policies worldwide. You mentioned some points where Russia needs to step down, as you said, where do we need to step down or step back? Well, we're not stepping forward. We are not stepping forward, we're not stepping on Russia's toes. If uh, Russia believes that, uh, and, and that is of course a basic tenet of Russia's uh, analysis, that NATO is aggressive, that's a mistaken analysis. Um, the EU um, has always extended uh, a hand to Russia throughout the 90s, later on, trying to integrate Russia in the eastern uh, um, uh, neighborhood policy, which Russia didn't want. Um, so I think we have to keep uh, working with Russia on uh, uh, all the topics that we can work together on, where we find common interests, like fighting terrorism, climate change, uh, cultural and, and scientific things. These are the, the areas in which you can actually do things. But where, where do we need to compromise as well? Um, what Russia asks of us right now is um, to talk to Ukraine so that Ukraine lives up to its obligations under the Minsk Agreement. And that's, I think, what we should be doing and I think what we are doing. Anything else? Well, wh what would you suggest? I don't know. Let's talk about Crimea, for example. Mm -hmm. Do we need to accept that Crimea uh, stays Russian for the rest of our lives? No. I mean, this is the first time you've had a military operation to seize the territory of another sovereign nation in Europe since 1945. Just to, to, to make clear that this is not something that you can simply you know, choose to ignore. I mean, we cannot stop all contacts with Russia because of Crimea. That is clear. But we cannot accept and will not accept that Crimea is part of Russia unless Ukraine decides to do something that Ukrainians are clearly not willing to do which is give up a part of the territory, and they're not willing to do that, and they are a sovereign nation. They gave up, I think we tend to forget that, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear arms that they inherited from the Soviet Union. They gave them back to Russia in return for a guarantee of their territorial integrity. And so, in my view, 
uh, uh, simply accepting that, that the annexation of Crimea would be dead wrong. First of all, on a matter of principle, it's, it's not okay to do that uh, under international law. And second of all, as a matter of politics, uh, particularly non-proliferation, which nuclear power or, or which country capable of having nuclear weapons would step down or would, would, would not you know, have them if uh, you're treated like this after giving them away. I think this is an, the non-proliferation aspect of the Crimean dimension is, is not discussed enough, but I think it's a, the most dangerous one, really, if you think of the global system. But what can we do about it? The annexation is a violation of international law, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried it with sanctions to have them cave in and uh, maybe give Crimea back. It hasn't been working in the last couple of years. So what... What do we need to change that Crimea becomes Ukrainian again? Well, sometimes it takes time. The Baltic republics were occupied by the Soviet Union for 50 years. We never accepted that either. Uh, we, couldn't, we wouldn't go to war with the Soviet Union over that, uh, and we won't go to war uh, with Russia over Crimea, but we will simply not accept the legal standpoint that Crimea is part of uh, Russia, full stop. And we'll have to live with that situation for a while, um, and see whether, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, a solution is, is possible. But do you, do you believe that we will, in our lifetime, uh, see Crimea go back to Ukraine? In your lifetime, possibly. <laughs> I hope in yours as well. I hope so, too, but you're significantly younger than I am. You're, you're the young one, I'm the naive one here. Mm. <laughs> mm. All right, let, let, let's talk about the, uh, our side, uh, the NATO side. Are you a fan of NATO? NATO or, is or, the, or were you like uh, in favor of the solving of NATO after uh, the wall fell? I, I, we, we spoke about where I come from sort of biographically. Um, I thought that, think that NATO, the interesting thing about NATO, NATO is a defensive alliance. NATO, the Western alliance brought down the Warsaw Pact, uh, led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union and essentially the end of communism as a military alliance without really using military means. The Cold War ended without turning into a hot war. And we, we're now reading about this uh, Thucydides trap and, 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 and how these major changes in the international system always are the result of wars. NATO has achieved this incredible turnaround, this turnaround that, that liberated Poland and Lithuania and Czechoslovakia and, and everybody else in Central Europe and in Russia uh, too, without firing a shot. And so, yes, I'm a fan of NATO historically, for the reasons I just said, and also politically because, at the end of the day, Germany is clearly incapable of defending itself were it not for NATO. And the same goes for Western Europe. And we are having this discussion about the, you know, raising our defense budget to 2%. If Germany didn't have its NATO membership, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be discussing 2%, we'd be discussing 3 or 4%. So I think NATO is an excellent deal. It's also an excellent political arrangement for us to, keep, uh, to, to, to be anchored in the West um, with our European friends. Were you in favor of the uh, intervention in Yugoslavia at the end of the 90s, which was a violation of international law? Well, the scholars are divided on that. Uh, I had great respect for Joschka Fischer. Gerd Schröder said so himself. Uh, he's a very renowned international scholar of, uh, <coughs> yes, I well, see. I mean, if the uh, chancellor of a nation that goes to war says we knew it, it was a violation of international law, it's important. It, uh, the interesting thing is, if you think about the uh, situation that, that was playing out in Kosovo, an evolving genocide, and you then think about the evolving consensus in the United Nations about the responsibility to protect. You may say that, they, that R2P wasn't around when Kosovo happened, but the principle that is enshrined in R2P, responsibility to protect, is exactly what has happened in Kosovo, uh, which is that a military alliance used military means to protect a population from being uh, uh, annihilated. And, and I think that was the right thing to do. It's never something you like to do. It's never easy. I have great respect to this day for Joschka Fischer in Bielefeld at the Party Congress of the Greens because they had just been elected in, 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 in uh, the German elections and he fought it through and he said, nie wieder Krieg, yes, but also nie wieder Auschwitz, no more genocides. And I think that was a right argument. It was well made. You remember this color thing, he was, uh, had, had color thrown at him. Um, I think it was the right decision, yes. 
remember this famous ARD doku that uh, it's called Es begann mit einer Lüge, uh, which Sharping and uh, Fisher used. I mean, you made the same argument uh, invoke, invoking the Holocaust, which was very heavy. Yeah, but preventing genocide, I think, is an important task for politicians who have a, a shred of humanity. Look, think of Srebrenica, uh, uh, Kosovo. I mean, we, we think of Rwanda. Um, we managed to prevent a genocide in Benghazi. People are of two minds about the merits of the Libyan uh, operation. But the genocide in Benghazi was prevented. That's the reason we don't talk about it now, because it was prevented. And so preventing genocide, I think, is a legit legitimate task for politicians. We're going to come to Libya later. Uh, what about Afghanistan? Were you in favor of invading Afghanistan? I lived in the United States on 9-11. Uh, I had friends who worked in the Pentagon uh, when it was attacked. Um, by, by Saudi Arabians? Who studied in Hamburg. Um, yes, no, seriously, 19 of the 20 people were, 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 came from Hamburg. Um, and yes, to root out uh, uh, um, the people who perpetrated the Sanus Act, uh, yes, I was in favor of that. Have you been in favor of the uh, military um, presence in Afghanistan ever since? Or have you voted for getting the Bundeswehr out of Afghanistan. I no, mean, it's I, been 18 years now. Yeah. No, I voted for them to stay. We had a lively debate about this in our parliamentary group, but I believe that for as long as you don't have a, a I don't want to talk about a solution, but an arrangement, an arrangement that secures basic liberties, basic you, you know, elements that we consider central to human dignity for the population in Afghanistan, unless you have that, I think it would be wrong for the West to simply withdraw and leave Afghanistan to itself because eventually it would turn into a, uh, a training ground for terrorists again. And that cannot be our task. We are down from 140,000, I think, now to 16, 17,000. So we have significantly diminished our presence there. Um, but for us to go home altogether, I think we need to have something like the Doha process we need some uh, a new Petersburg conference. We need something that, that, that uh, is more stable than the situation would be if we were simply choosing to retire without such an arrangement. But I mean, the German presence was increased the last two years uh, by a few hundred uh, soldiers. When comes the point when you say they need to come home? As soon as we have an arrangement that guarantees basic human dignity for the majority of the population. And even if that means doing a deal with the Taliban? Yes. How hard is that? Very hard, but the Taliban have changed too. I think they have come to the recognition that they cannot go back to their old ways. That's why there is this uh, US-led process in, in Doha, or was in, in Doha with Khalizad. Um, I hope that this can lead to something. I, I hope that, I mean, I hope that we can bring you know, our soldiers home. But I, I, I'm not prepared to say, let's take them home regardless of what happens in Afghanistan. And so it means to, you have to talk to everyone. You have to talk to uh, uh, the, the people in the north, you have to talk to uh, the people in the east, and you have to talk to the Taliban. Have you been to Mazar sharif where the Bundeswehr no. is? We've been there like two years ago. When you uh, see that like 99% of the soldiers there stay inside the base. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Germans are leading the leading nation there. They stay inside the base. They are tr basically, they say they are trapped there. Like only 1% of you go out every day, check and uh, go to Mazar -e Sharif and all that, do their, have their contacts there. Um, and the training. They feel they're, they're doing nothing there. Um, they feel uh, that it's not what they um, uh, signed up for when they heard, when they heard the mission. I mean, you can you can see it. We we put it online that it interviews with them. They feel uh, useless there. With all respect to our men and women in uniform, I think that's a political decision. Um, the Bundestag has decided to extend the mandate because we are there as part of an alliance. As you said, we're the lead nation. So many other nations rely on the Bundeswehr's presence, and I, I think that the political process is the decisive factor here. I regret it if, if, if a soldier feels that the work they are doing is not sort of living up to their expectations, but that's not the primary criterion. The primary criterion is can we create 
stability for Afghanistan? Can we create a situation in Afghanistan that does not lead to a situation that would give us another 9-11? What do, you, what do you make of the latest stats by the United Nations where it said that the, in the first six months in Afghanistan, the Western Alliance killed more civilians than the Taliban? I don't know that stat. Yeah, that's a United Nations uh, stat. Like we, because the Americans do uh, airstrikes and drone strikes and they kill more civilians right now than the Taliban. I mean, th th that doesn't help with uh, getting, having, having peace in Afghanistan. Well, um, I, I don't want to talk about a statistic that I haven't seen. What I, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't, I don't doubt that the statistic exists. I just don't want to talk about a statistic that I haven't seen. I don't know the sources for. Well, I mean, I want, I want to talk about our deeds, our yeah. our responsibility, yeah. not the other. Well, I think, I mean, what we are trying to do as the West collectively is to get the uh, Afghan security forces up to a sort of level of capability that they can ensure the security of the Afghan population. That's, that's basically the idea. We don't do the combat operations ourselves. The Americans have a national uh, operation there. But that is something that, that we are uh, trying. And um, the statistic, as I said, I don't want to talk about it. I don't know the numbers. I don't know the absolute numbers. I don't know the relative numbers. So forgive me if I don't answer the question. Do, does Germany have different interests than the Americans in Afghanistan? No, I think the um, interests that we have are the same, but they are pursued through different alleys. It's like the, with the French in Mali. You have a French operation in Mali that's a national operation that is very much very robust, uh, very kinetic, very much anti-terror. And you have a, uh, a United Nations mission, and, and which is m much more focusing on training, on stabilization, on support. And the same system you have, in, in it's the, more or less the same system, the same... Uh, uh, yeah, build up, set up in, 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 in Afghanistan, where you have the Americans who are more robustly uh, engaged fighting terrorism, fighting the Taliban, uh, whereas the uh, uh, Germans and Europeans are engaged in um, training the Afghan security forces. Do we have geopolitical interests in Afghanistan? Yes, we do, because the world has become so much smaller. The world has become much, much, much smaller. I mean, 9-11 as you said, as you rightly said, was perpetrated by a lot of people from Saudi Arabia who were from Hamburg, Harburg, to be precise, uh, which, I mean, there's somebody from Hamburg who just chuckled, but it's, <laughs> but, but it's true. I mean, we are all connected with one another. Whether we want to believe that or not, the world is getting much more interconnected. And so if we ignore Afghanistan, we ignore it at our peril. And the same goes for the Sahel. That's why I'm also in support of the mission in Mali. But what, our, what are our geopolitical interests in Afghanistan? The interest is for Afghanistan not to be a training ground for terrorists. And for that to, to achieve that, you need a, a minimum of, of economic well-being, you need a minimum of, a, 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 of human dignity, you need a, a minimum of security, you need all of these things. And when that is guaranteed, I think our mission is accomplished. You, you talked about Libya. I mean, um, the last... Uh, no. The, Guido Westerwelle was the foreign minister back then, and he famously abstained mm -hmm. uh, when it came to the uh, United Security Council decision on uh, Libya, uh, which uh, nowadays seemed to be the right the right choice. I disagreed with him then. I disagree with him now posthumously. I, I, it's very sorry, sorry that he passed away. Um, I mean, the invasion alert uh, turned into chaos in, in Libya the last five years. Well, the, the alternative would have been a, a genocide in a city of a million people. Benghazi has a million people, and the uh, statements from Gaddafi were absolutely clear. He was going to crush uh, the population uh, in Benghazi. He was going to eradicate them, squash them like bugs. I mean, it was very, very clear. And so the intervention there, I think, was justified. And I regretted that Germany at the time voted against or did not vote with our Western allies. I, I, Guido and I, we, we've discussed this many, many times. I think um, even if you have reservations about such a mission, you don't put yourself in a, a position where Germany votes against France, the United Kingdom, and the United States and put yourselves on the side of, of China and uh, Russia and such an issue. Well, maybe we had different interests, geopolitical interests back then. I mean, France... Uh, in Italy are on, on both sides of the conflict uh, right now. The Americans uh, wanted to invade for other reasons. Uh, maybe we were smart enough 
The Americans didn't want to invade. Libya, the, the Hillary, Libya Clinton, Hillary Clinton made uh, Barack Obama, he said it in his book, in his biography, that she made him uh, go support a mission that was essentially led by the French and the Brits. Politically, it was, it was more, mostly the French who were in favor of, of having uh, action there. It was a European-led initiative in the Security Council. And what turned out to be true is that after 48 hours, the European military capabilities had run out, and then the Americans stepped in, and the mission was led from Stuttgart. That is true. Um, but you didn't see an invasion. There was no invasion. There were no ground troops. Uh, there was a mission to uh, 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 separate uh, eastern and western uh, Libya, so the Cyrenaica from uh, Tripolitania, in order to prevent uh, Gaddafi's troops from entering Benghazi. I agree with you that the current situation is not pleasant. It's not pleasant at all. I was there in 2012 to observe the first elections to uh, set up a, a constituent assembly. That was extremely difficult. It was very, very difficult and it's difficult to this day. But again, um, Having prevented a genocide, I think, um, was worth the risk. And now we need to find ways to pacify the country and bring it together uh, into a stable political order. So the chaos right now is was worth it? Um, yes. If you save a million lives, um, I think um, that is a risk you can take. I would have preferred another outcome. I mean, that's why I went. I, it's not... It's not no fun going to Libya. Um, Have you been to those concentration camps, as the Auswärtige Amt calls it? No, but I know where they are, because I've been uh, to the places where they are, in, in Tripoli and, and, and uh, east of Tripoli, and I have no doubt whatsoever that they are absolutely terrible. Um, but the migration uh, crisis of 2015 was, uh, in my view, is not related to uh, um, the Libyan intervention in 2011. It uses the weakness of Libyan statehood, um, to uh, uh, um, sort of the the the, 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 um, the traffickers, ah, yes. the, the traffickers use the extreme weakness of the Libyan state to uh, uh, um, you know to, and, and use the territory there, but the intervention in 2011 was unrelated to that because four years prior. Should we even talk? Uh, or Call it a state? Is it actually like a state? Oh. I mean, it seems like a, a territory um, controlled by different warlords, the Italians support this one, the French support this one. Who do we support, actually? The who, question... Who's, who's our guy there? I mean, uh, in, in Afghanistan, it's Mr. Atta, the yeah, warlord. It's, it's the, the Libyan prime minister was recognized by the United Nations. And the um, question of whether Libya is a state or not, the Libyans themselves discuss this sometimes, uh, but not so much because of the current chaos, but because of the fact that the two parts of the country are so distinct and so separate. They are held together really, I mean, they were held together, first of all by a king, King Idris, and then, then by Gaddafi and his, his, his regime. Uh, but, but primarily, the entire place is held together by the oil, which happens uh, to be right in the middle between the two parts of the country, and that, of course, glues the country together. So the decisive question in everything you do in Libya is, how do you split the revenues from the oil? If they, you have a fair distribution between the East and the West, the country as such may function if you give enough autonomy to the people in Cyrenaica. If you don't, it's, it's going to be difficult again. I mean, in the early 21st century right now, we've seen a lot of wars uh, uh, for oil. Iraq as, as well. Uh, do you think those wars will become unnecessary when we become independent of fossil energy? They will become much less important, much uh, rarer if, if, you, if you think of, of, of resources as a primary uh, motivation uh, for military conflict, obviously, yes. And it's going to change. I mean, I the energy transition will change the geopolitics uh, of essentially the entire world. Absolutely. Maybe we will someday have to invade the, the Sahara f for, for solar energy. For solar energy. Okay, can we take that down? Uh, <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> yes. We cut that part and leave the other ones. But, uh, but let, let, let's stick, uh, I'm going to turn to you and your questions in a few minutes, but let's stick to international law. Uh, you mentioned uh, Stuttgart, Afrikom, uh, there's also Rammstein uh, in Germany. Uh, the US is clearly violating international law for years now with their drone strikes around the world, which is, um, uh, the relay, relay station is Rammstein, the German government itself. Um, 
said so in the in the German Bundestag. Uh, Michael Roth uh, admitted that um, Germany right now is ignoring uh, that uh, the U.S. is drone striking all over the world. Where? where? We'll be precise. Where, where, where do you see these drone strikes happening? In Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, all over Africa, uh, and the Middle East. Interesting. These are facts. And there was, um, a, there was a court case as well. I, I know that uh, for uh, Eastern Afghanistan. Yes. And there it's, it's uh, clear. You have it in the, uh, also on the Pakistani side of uh, um, Somalia, the border. Yemen, Djibouti, all over Africa. Yes. What, yes. What, what do you want to do uh, uh, to stop that? Like, uh, why, why doesn't the German government tell the Americans you need to stop that? That's against the Grundgesetz. Well, I mean, the um, basis is, as far as I know, are extraterritorial. However, what I think we should do German, is... German ground. Grund. Yes, Deutscher but... Boden. Yeah, um, but I think that uh, uh, we will have to discuss this with the Americans. I mean, when they use German bases for me uh, measures like this, um, and they are um, sort of acting in their own sort of sovereign uh, national uh, military uh, uh, way... Uh, that is something we would have to discuss with them. I'm not sure whether it's against um, uh, international, uh, against German law uh, that these things are, are going there's, on. There's a law case. Yes, it's clearly against German law. Well, I, 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 I mean, why do you, why do we even want to discuss something that is clearly wrong from a German perspective? You can, you can talk about the American perspective, mm. what they, what their reasons are for uh, drone strikes, uh, but when it comes to German law and German politics, we, sh we should simply say no and tell them to stop it. You why think do, what, so? What, yes, of course. Okay. What's the problem? Well, I think the problem is that um, if you uh, tell the Americans to do that uh, uh, sort of from another uh, territory, they will do it from another territory. So very little will change in all likelihood, number one. Number two... But at least is, we are not... Uh, yes, we are not, we're not implicated. I, under I understand your point, but we are, and that is of course another issue. Uh, we are serving with the Americans in a number of theaters, and uh, we are allied with the Americans on sort of security issues. Um, and so therefore, on, on that particular issue, um, it's a topic for discussion. I would not say stop it right away. I would not say so, to be very clear. These are violations against I, I, international I, I, I law and I understand. war crimes. Well, no, no, no. That's, that depends on uh, the issue uh, where it... I mean, look, look at Somalia. What, what, what's the issue in Somalia? Where, where do they use drone strikes in Somalia? It is against the Al-Shabaab. I mean, they, they, they killed, like, two weeks ago uh, a few civilians again where they tried to hit uh, a, suppo a supposed uh, te terrorist organization, but they killed civilians again. Which means, I mean, even the gem American generals say those drone strikes mm -hmm. that kill more civilians than supposed terrorists are uh, fueling terrorism. Which is unwise, and I, wouldn't, I would counsel against it. But uh, look, if you, if you think of the Somalian situation... You want to stop them. The Al-Shabaab militia, the Al-Shabaab militia has killed... Dozens of people in Nairobi in, in, in terrorist attacks. They kill people in Mombasa. They are, they are all the way, they're destabilizing Eastern Africa. They are, they are a, a terrorist group just like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And so I think combating such groups is, again, we come back to this issue of, of uh, preventing uh, harm being done to, to civilian populations, is a legitimate political undertaking. And therefore, I think it is a topic for discussion on whether you find a, a different way of doing it legally, whether you want to do it from another base. But I think that the basic imperative that is behind the politics needs to be discussed rather than, be, uh, than, than stopped uh, uh, cold. Uh, there are many uh, scholars, American scholars, international scholars, that uh, say... Uh, fighting terrorism with terrorism is not a good idea because it's uh, they could call it state terrorism. Drone striking somebody without a trial, uh, just on um, vague information, uh, isn't that like a, a principle of Western uh, Western politics that we don't send people to die? Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations clearly establishes the right to defend yourself. And if, for example, let's take the, the Al-Shabaab... The Americans don't defend themselves in Somalia well, but, against but they Al-Shabaab. But they rabbit. defend Kenya, and the Kenyan government well, is Kenyans, fully behind we, them. We can help the Kenyans. 
but the Americans are helping the Kenyans if they fight Al Shabaab. That's the point. I mean, you can invoke Article 51 as a uh, individual self-defense or as a collective self-defense. If the Kenyans ask the Americans fight Al Shabaab for us, and they do so, that is covered by Article 51. And the other international uh, violation I want to talk about when it comes to blind spots in Germany uh, or in, in European politics is the Middle East, uh, the Middle East. Uh, conflict. Um, Israel is uh, still expanding their settlements in the occupied territories. Uh, you cannot, by international law, uh, settle anybody there from your own, uh, on your own country, from your own population, which is a war crime. Uh, the, the Israelis have been doing this for more than 50 years, uh, violating international law. What can, what can we do uh, besides just saying we're against it? No, first of all, I agree with you. The settlements are a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, we have told the Israelis so on many occasions. Um, and uh, we will continue to do so. And I think that the recent repositioning of the United States, declaring them legal from their perspective, was a mistake. Um, because I think it makes it more difficult to achieve a solution with the Palestinians. Uh, we have clearly spoken out, for example, against the uh, sort of permissions for settlements in Area E1, which would make a two-state solution essentially unviable. Um, but that's diplomacy. We have to try to keep the pressure up um, and, and, and be very clear about this. But I mean, um, I've been to Israel as well. I talked to those politicians there. They are laughing when they hear that Europe is mm -hmm. uh, wagging the finger uh, when they say, oh, international law, international law, when nothing's happened. Well, I think that's... Uh, I mean, we, we, we wagged our finger when it came to Russia and Crimea and said, this is a violation of international law. We're going to uh, introduce sanctions that you're going to give it back. You think the Russians laughed? No. But as you said, we mm -hmm. should keep trying and trying, and at some point it will, it will stop. Shouldn't we start doing that with Israel, maybe? No, I, I'm totally against uh, the idea of uh, applying sanctions uh, to Israel. I, I think that would be absolutely wrong. It's the only democracy that we have in the region. It's an ally. Israel exists only, That's right. only because of the Shoah, but which are, was perpetrated are, are they, by Germany. Is Israel above international law? Nobody is above international law. Nobody is. And uh, so, therefore, we keep addressing the issue with the Israelis, and I think we should continue to do that. I think we should continue to offer our good offices in the uh, Middle East peace process. We should continue developing good ideas, how to make progress there. And uh, we have to then recognize uh, what's going on in, in, in Israeli domestic politics. I mean, we may have the third election now within a year, uh, which, is, which is sort of, in a, it's a democratic thing. The prime minister has just been indicted. Uh, by the uh, general prosecutor, so it's it's a very lively democratic uh, situation there, and we will we will continue. Yeah, no, it's it's really lively and democratic. Uh, hui, hui, hui. Um, <laughs> Um, but we will continue to engage with the um, Israelis who are our closest partner and a, we have a special relationship and I think the last thing a German policymaker should do is sit on a panel and say we, we're going to sanction Israel because we think they do, do something that is wrong. We tell them that it's, we think it's wrong but we will not sanction Israel. I just wanted to know if is there anything you want to do besides saying words uh, when it comes to international uh, violations of international law. Well, I mean, in diplomacy, words matter. I mean, you can read it. I mean, read the tweets by Donald Trump. They, believe me, they matter. Uh, and, and words matter. So when we, we, when we are very clear about this, and uh, the Israelis know that all of the European Union is, has a particular viewpoint concerning these settlements, as, for example, expressed recently in the verdict of the uh, European Court of Justice, um, it matters. And you can see it in the reactions. Of course it matters. So words are not nothing in diplomacy. The alternatives, you can, you can escalate. You, have, you can have, have, have restrictive measures. You have can sanctions. You can have visa restrictions. Can, tons of things and, uh, up until military conflict. But to say that words don't matter in international politics, I think, would be wrong. Uh, which is suge suggesting that after more than 50 years, maybe one should rethink the approach when it comes to the occupation. Well, I mean, let's not forget that the occupation was caused by all of Israel's neighbors invading the country. Israel has the size of the state of Hesse. Hessen. That's, that's how big Israel is. So one, one thing that goes wrong there in a military conflict with its neighbors and the country ceases to exist. So what I believe is when we talk about the occupation, we should not 
sort of posit that this was just an idea that somehow appeared in uh, Israeli uh, politicians' minds and then happened. No, they were attacked militarily by all of their neighbors all at the same time. Have you been to Gaza or the West Bank? Have you I've been to the West Bank, not to Gaza. Where, where, where did you go in the West Bank? East Jerusalem and Ramallah. What did you think of the living conditions of the Palestinians there? Uh, depends. Uh, some are uh, doing okay, others are not doing okay because the um, roadblocks are not nice. Uh, we, we all know that. Um, but uh, I think um, that uh, compared to some other spots uh, uh, in the Arab world, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Particularly for those who have work, who can go to Israel to work. Personally, we went to Gaza last year and a day later we went to Hebron and Hebron shocked me even more than, than Gaza. I mean, I expected the worst in Gaza and wasn't disappointed, but I didn't expect what, what's going on in Hebron. We did a documentary on that. Maybe you should look it up. You want to go to questions from the audience? Absolutely. All right, let's uh, start with him and then we come to you over there. Could you introduce yourself? Gijs de Vries, uh, formerly Dutch government, now London School of Economics. Uh, thank you for the excellent exchange. Um, very good questions, equally good answers. My question is about the European Union and Germany's role as the leading member state of the European Union. I think there is a legitimate debate about whether the European Central Bank gets its priorities right. We can have different opinions. But I was struck by the cartoon published, I think, in Bild a little while ago, where Mario Draghi was portrayed um, uh, uh, as uh, uh, pilfering German pockets. Um, now, that is the freedom of the press. But Bild would not publish that if there wouldn't be a sentiment in the German population that Southerners are untrustworthy, lazy, and out to rob us. That undermines German support for European institutions. My question is, what are German politicians doing to counter this trend, which is an asset that tends to erode democratic legitimacy in Germany for its European leadership? Geist, th thanks for the question. First of all, I have to contradict you. Germany is not the leading nation in the European Union. They're the most powerful one, right? No. Germany is not the most powerful nation in the U no. European Union? Who is no. it? France. France? Yes. Um, let's, let's talk to Ma Macron about that. Yeah, I think he thinks so, too. <laughs> um, All right. No, I mean, li li listen, I mean, after Brexit, there's one country in the European Union with a permanent seat on the Security Council. There's one country with nuclear weapons. That's France. There's one country that has a, a president with, you know, who gives speeches and ideas and impulsions, and sometimes they're welcomed and sometimes they're not so welcome. But uh, it, France is the country that drives European debates. Germany is, uh, someone suggested to me I should compare Germany to Oblomov. I don't know those of you who know uh, Russian literature. Uh, Germany is a little bit like Oblomov. Uh, you know, very wealthy, but in bed, and doesn't get out of bed. Um, we're, we're lazy, but bed is nice, it's bed warm, is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't but need if, to change anything. Novel, the guy is in bed for 300 pages, so it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> No, but we have, I mean, literally, I mean, we, have, we have a chancellor who's clearly on her way out. We have a discussion about the succession, who's going to be the successor to the chancellor. Um, she's got great respect internationally, but of course people realize that, that, that she's a lame duck politically, 24 months to go. Um, so I think clearly the most powerful, the most influential, the driving, the dynamic nation now is, is, is France. Uh, um, that's number one. Number two, I've come to this place after 13 years in Brussels. Um, I was not surprised because I followed the German media, of course, and I'm, I'm a German politician. I was a German politician when I was a European politician as well. Um, you know what shocked me most? The built cartoon is one thing. What really shocked me is when Emmanuel Macron gave his speech at the Sorbonne about a Europe sovereign democratic and free. That was sort of the top, the, the, the line. And the, the, the chapter on sovereignty had six sub-chapters. The last one of these sub-chapters dealt with EMU, Economic Monetary Union. 
The others dealt with digitization, with security, with migration, with Africa, da 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 da. What was the reception in this town? In the German media, in the Frankfurter, in the Handelsblatt, in the elite papers? He just wants to get our money. All Macron wants is our money. And if that is the discourse about the European Union, you have a problem, and Germany has a problem there. We do have a problem there. Why did the AfD get so prominent in its early days? Because it was an anti-euro party. It's because uh, the, the people who set up the AfD as an anti-euro party were given pages and pages and pages in the papers I just quoted to lay out their ideas. It was an anti-European impulsion in the elite media. And um, that is the real problem, I think. And, and it's something that really worries me. So what do we do against that? Um, I think we have to come up with our own ideas. We have to come up with a positive vision of Europe. We have to make it clear to the German public that this entire debate about netto zahler is absolutely ridiculous. 60% of our exports go to the European Union. If we were to pay customs fees on all of our exports to our neighbors, we could shut down this republic. At least our social security system that gobbles up, that, 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 that eats up nearly, I mean, I mean so much, nearly a third of the national budget. It, it would simply be impossible. The European Union is a, an incredibly good deal for Germany, but there are some people, and there are, and that's the interesting thing, we, we come back to this neoliberal business, they're very old-style, ordo-liberal, who, who still think of, of economics as a national discipline. In Germany, economics is called Volkswirtschaft. No, it's it's the, the one Volk, one Wirtschaft. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way any longer. We, are, we live in a globalized uh, economy, and in that globalized economy, the European Union, for us, is the, the economic base of our success. So when you seem to think that Germany is still the most powerful country in Europe, that has to do with the fact that our economic situation comes you know, uh, from our access to the European market. Um, and so that, that's what we need to hammer home, hammer home, hammer home again and again and again and again. Um, but it's, it's a tough sell. And um, I'm happy to have a few colleagues from the European Parliament across parties who do that now, Franziska Brandner, Martin Schulz and all the others. I talked to Jens Weidmann a, a few days ago, Bundesbank mm -hmm. president and ECB board member uh, about Eurobonds. And since, based on, based on what you just said, is it anti-European to be against Eurobonds? No. Like, I'm, I'm in favor of Eurobonds because mm -hmm. I'm against, this is our money. Mm -hmm. This is... Yeah, but the, the, bond, the bonds are debts. I mean, essentially, what you may, when you issue bonds, you issue debt. Okay, um, and the problem that we had when we discussed euro bonds for the first time was that we had a major debt crisis on our hands, and the debt crisis to fight the debt crisis with more debt didn't seem very logical to us. What what seems logical to us is to see to it that the economic policy making in the European Union follows a little bit in the lines of what Macron has done. Macron has run on a platform saying only a strong France will contribute to a strong Europe. And a strong Europe is what we need in the 21st century. And to create a strong France, he said, we must make our economy more competitive. That's why the tax reform, a labor law reform, and a number of other things, which I believe is the supply side thing uh, approach that, that works. But I mean, the, the Macron approach seems to be like uh, when alle an sich selbst denken, ist ihm geholfen. Uh, if, when everybody thinks of themselves, everybody uh, else profits as well. That that's not the case. I mean, it, it has been like this in the eurozone for 20 years, and it's still not stable. Uh, no, I think that's not Macron's uh, way of thinking. Uh, but he re recognizes that if you look at the competences in the treaty, economic policy making, social policy making, and taxation are national competences. Maybe we should change that. That's a different matter. You can discuss that. For economic policy making, for example, through the European semester, there's a soft approach to, to, to actually do that. Uh, the country specific recommendations that come out of the European semester are very, very, very uh, calmly ignored in uh, Berlin. Um, because if not, we would have a completely different economic dis discussion here. So yes, there is there's a point for that to we be made. We don't want to change anything. We're fine. We're Oblomov. We're taking advantage of everybody else. We're fine. Okay, over there. Uh, microphone. 
and uh, maybe next to you, a woman. Um, yes. I'm Hugh Pope. I'm with the International Crisis Group in Brussels. Um, thanks for a fascinating, f fluent, and such a clear discussion. It's been great. I have a question about a topic which I know you're also an expert on, which hasn't come up yet, and there's a question that was left hanging from the last uh, session, which is what to do about Turkey. And you've talked about arrangements, international law, and so forth. The European Union made an offer to Turkey for membership. Is that working? Can it be changed with anything? I know that I spent years as a, an analyst in Istanbul trying to write the plan B for I Turkey, <laughs> but it was a blank piece of paper. I couldn't work it out. Have you managed to? Well, I, I think uh, uh, Turkey has been, I mean, I've, I've been the rapporteur for Turkey in my political group. We've seen each other in Bodrum a couple of times. So I think if enlargement, if the EU enlargement, for example, Western Balkans, any kind of enlargement is to happen again, that, is, that presupposes an end of the accession talks with Turkey. Because my voters, when I say enlargement and then say Northern Macedonia, they hear Turkey. I can say enlargement and then say Albania, they hear Turkey. I can say enlargement and say Serbia, they hear Turkey. And they're afraid. They don't want Turkey in. There's an 80% opposition in this country and in France and in Austria and in the Netherlands. So we are still going through this kabuki theater of an accession process that has long since been dead. The progress reports have been regress reports. But there is a lack of courage in the Council, in the European Council, to finally hammer out what I would call a Grundlagenvertrag, a basic treaty that takes all the topics on which you want to cooperate with Turkey, puts them into a neighborhood, uh, DCFTA, you, you combine it in whichever way you want, and puts our relationship on a, on, on, on a more solid footing. That could include, for example, deepening the customs union to extend it to the services. Uh, that could include visa liberalization. That could include so many things. Turkey is a difficult neighbor right now, and so I'm not talking short term. Yeah, but, but I think uh, the enlargement paradigm for Turkey is dead. It's, it's, it's complete, it has been dead for years. The parliament has finally recognized it. The European parliament has voted to end the negotiations. Johannes Hahn has been between the lines also quite clear that he doesn't think there's a great future, so we'll see what the new enlargement commissioner would do. But uh, the council needs to get its act together. Maybe a follow-up. Like on principle, do you want Turkey to be in the EU someday with, you know, uh, without uh, an autocratic uh, leader without again let, let's suppose there will be a democratic government you mean when Turkey looks like Norway <laughs> I don't know yeah no but but, the, but let's be real but, but, I mean but, le, le, even <laughs> no of course not the CHP had always said they wanted to but they didn't want to really when you looked at their policies uh, uh, role of the army uh, fighting the Kurds the CHP has been very aggressive so the AKP said we want to be a member at the outset because they were not the CHP and it, it, it helped them a little bit. But uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, the political elite in Turkey is not helped by uh, uh, sort of, you know, going through the motions of an accession process with all its uh, that's details. Why, that's why I said let's uh, leave out Erdogan. Let's suppose he will be succeeded no. by a democratic government, pro-European. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, let's, uh, we want to become a member of EU. Mm -hmm. Would Alex say, of course? No. Okay. No. Next question. Uh, hi, yes. uh, I'm Frauke Siebers. I'm with Polis 180. Um, and I wanted to go back to the question of drone strikes. I found it a bit problematic the way that was uh, left here. When we say that we want to protect civilian lives, um, that it gives us the right, or that it gives a sovereign nation the right to decide that it's okay to have civilian casualties and to have civilians dying in another sovereign nation. And um, I agree with you that, um, of course, it, is, it can be justified um, in order to save civilian lives to intervene in a different country. Um, RTP already mentioned it. But aren't there other ways? Don't we have to think about, um, which is a very painful question, especially uh, if you have an army that is, um, uh, that, that the parliament um, is commanding, let's say, um, that maybe ground troops would be an option or any, any other kind of military intervention, intervention that does not have the same rate of um, spreading fear among the population and killing civilians in the dozens. 
If you go to Ulm or Koblenz or Neustadt am Rübenberge and talk to the soldiers' families about sending ground troops to southern Somalia, um, that's what we have to do. I mean, we, we do that. Um, one could discuss this option, fine. Um, however, I think the Bundeswehr is neither capable nor would be politically be willing uh, to do that. Um, we are fighting um, piracy off uh, the coast of Somalia and the Gulf of Aden there, um, but I don't think that ground troops are um, a solution. Now, having said that, if there are alternatives, for example, for example, a UN-led Chapter 7 mission of the Eastern Africans, you know, going under a mandate of the United Nations into Somalia to, 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 to fight Al-Shabaab, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If, if that really is, is, a, is a better solution, yes. Um, so I don't say that drone strikes are a, a, a matter of choice or a, 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 an instrument of choice. Um, but German ground troops down there, I think, is, is a very courageous proposal. I guess my question is, are um, soldiers, let's say Western soldiers, are their lives worth more than, than those of the civilians in that country? I mean, is there, isn't there an ethical question that we have to ask if we say that we are acting on a moral imperative, that it's okay for us to, to have these drone strikes instead of, I don't know, taking the uncomfortable decision to send those who are, yeah. Those yeah, but there is, I, I, I always, uh, that, that's something that, that, that maybe one should emphasize. One has to be realistic about one's own means. What can we really do? There needs to be a certain degree of humility also as to what we can really do and achieve. And uh, uh, um, I think we should not overestimate ourselves. If there is an, an allied mission, for example, I mean, if one wants to speculate about a, a future mission, um, it would not be Somalia, but, but the Gulf of Guinea, piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. Can our navy make a contribution in a uh, sort of uh, in, in an international European UN-led mission? Yes, probably could do something there. Can we make a, a combat mission contribution in southern Somalia? Who else would be wanting to go there? Would we do it nationally? I would advise against that. Would we do it internationally? Would we send combat troops? I'm not sure how the discussion is going to go in the Bundestag. I have an idea. We have, can we make it uh, two together, two, two final questions, and I have one, and then we, we're done. OK. Uh, Lorenz Hemik, I'm with the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, Mr. Lambsdorff, one of the biggest threats to mankind still is, is despite facts that we see climate change and so on, uh, the nuclear uh, weapons on Earth. And uh, despite we have the end of the Cold War reached 30 years before, we still have hundreds of nuclear weapons in high alert status in Washington and America as well as in Moscow and Russia. Germany. Um, pardon me? No. Germany. Uh, Germany. Uh, we have German high alert. I'm not sure if the technical... Well, but, but we have nuclear weapons here. But there are lots of them. Um, my question to you is, um, against the background that we see an, an U.S. president who is very often spontaneous, maybe unrational, uh, an eroding uh, system of nuclear treaties, new tensions between uh, Russia and America, seeing all those exercise incidents, um, what do you think should Germany do? Should Germany try uh, to start an initiative? I mean, we are now in the uh, United Nations Security Council to try to reduce the number of weapons in high alert status. Should Germany uh, try to um, raise another uh, treaty system or even show its willingness to taking over um, nuclear responsibility? Uh, example giving in a circumstance of a European nuclear force. Thank you. Let, let's answer right away. And we're going to come to you yeah. next. Um, first of all, we are already part of the nuclear deterrent of NATO because there are, as you said, nuclear weapons in Germany, in the Eiffel. They're not on high alert. Do, do you guys still want to do get them out? No. You, uh, under Westerwelle, you, you wanted to get them out? Yes. <laughs> all right. Wie sagte Konrad Adenauer, I'm going to say this in German now, uh, ähm, auch der politische Gegner kann äh, nicht verhindern, dass ich von Tag zu Tag klüger werde. Ähm, so, the, uh, 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 Germany is part of the nuclear deterrent of NATO because we share uh, the nuclear risk in NATO uh, and therefore we believe that uh, um, it would be wrong to get them out. That's number one. Number two, uh, I believe that uh, 
Germany has a role to play. We are a non-nuclear nation with nuclear capabilities. I mean, we could, if we wanted to, technologically develop nuclear weapons. We have not done so. We will not do so under the NPT and under the 2 plus 4 treaty. And therefore, I think uh, um, trying, trying to find new ways of uh, reducing uh, the high alert status of nuclear uh, arms is a very good idea. However, that would require that we have some senior representative in the Foreign Office to do that. Uh, we have just uh, integrated our com Department for Arms Control into the General Global Affairs Department and, and we've lost essentially our commissioner there for arms control. And I th would give that issue more prominence. I would also try to work through the Conference for Disarmament in Geneva. I would try to talk to the developing world that it does not insist on this time-bound uh, uh, um, new global zero that they always ask for the CD to have a meeting in the first place. If one wants to be productive, if one wants to have conversations about these issues, and I think one should have conversations, the CD in Geneva would be the best forum. Um, but there it's not just the nuclear powers who are a problem, it's also the non-nuclear powers. And if Germany wants to do something there together with the other European countries, I would very much welcome that. Just a quick follow-up, uh, the German government refused to join the UN treaty on banning nuclear weapons last year. Are you in favor of us joining? No. Good. Clear answers are a good thing, obviously. Thank you for a fascinating discussion, which I really think is... Can uh, you introduce yourself very quick? Yes, my name is Lotte Leicht. I'm the director of Human Rights Watch in Europe. Um, I think it is important to just recognize, also when we talk about drone strikes or we talk about allies and friends and enemies, that we're not operating in a rules-free environment. There are international rules, and Germany should be one of those countries that should stand up and, uh, and defend those rules. And uh, extrajudiciary targeted killings outside armed conflicts are what they are. They're killings, and they're outside law. So I hope you will, you will sort of uh, re finesse your position on this, because I really think it is important, and I, I've known you for many, many years, so I, I think that that is something you can do. I wanted actually to ask you about a position, or your position on something that could be imminent and that will exactly challenge commitment to international rules and uh, our, our friendships with partners. The International Criminal Court uh, is likely, uh, during this prosecutor, to open two critical criminal investigations, one on Israel-Palestine and one on Afghanistan. In both situations, at least our key ally in, in the United States will get a fit and has already said so. So my, my question to you is, what should Germany do when the prosecutor comes out and says, look, I am starting on the basis of facts, on the basis of international law, on the basis of a mandate of an international criminal court that Germany helped to create. I will now do my job and I will start these criminal investigations whether countries will go bananas or not. How would Germany and how would you personally respond to this in a way that could cool down tempers, uh, but maintain a clear and uh, principled positions towards international law? Well, it, it, it would depend on the individuals against uh, whom the... But that is not said, the Trump administration and other administrations have been fighting the ICC. I know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not recognizing them. There's an invasion act, the Hague Invasion Act, uh, when <laughs> if yeah, if American soldiers could should ever go to Den Haag, the Amer Americans mm -hmm. reserve the right to invade the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a principle, of course, of international law that you're only bound by those conventions that you agree to be bound by. That's that's very important. Um, there are some okay conventions. Some are erga omnes. Some apply to all. That is not the case for the Rome Statute. The, the, yes, but the Rome Statute specifically is not ergo omnes. Uh, and so therefore, if, if we want to have a legal argument, if, if it's a legal argument, one has to say, does the statute apply to the individuals or the countries that are being investigated? Yes or no? If, for example, it is about American activities in Afghanistan, the Rome Statute would not apply. I, I, I disagree. She says it's not true because we can't hear you. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Lotte and I have a disagreement on that. Um, I think... 
well, the Rome Statute clearly says, I mean, you have to, you have to be a signatory, you have to, have to ratify it. It, it there's, there's four crimes that can be investigated, four particular crimes. You have to have a national judiciary that is either unwilling or incapable of uh, uh, doing it. And so you have a number of conditions that need to be fulfilled for the, the court to be able to step up and to do something about that. And uh, so there, I think, and that, that, that is, that's a very delicate issue here, and we've, had, we've seen this in the Libyan case with the R2P. If one moves on issues of international law in a way, in a direction, in a speed, that then turns out to be counterproductive, I'm not sure we're helping international law. On R2P, for example, the Russians abstained, and so therefore the Libya uh, intervention was covered by the resolution of the Security Council. The Russians now say the, the Western alliance went too far and is not willing to endorse R2P any longer. But shouldn't we, upheld, we, shouldn't we be upheld to the same standards that we uh, use on others? Yes, but why? I don't well, get the point. She's, she's asking about that. No, but that's about Israel. And I mean, if, for example, a, a sub, if we had, if Germany were committing a war of aggression or a crime against humanity, and we were simply uh, saying it never happened and, and we were uh, investigated by the court, we are a signatory, the uh, statute applies to us, and then you can have an investigation. But to have a court proceeding against uh, nationals of a country that is not a signatory is, is uh, I think, is, is impossible. Maybe we can discuss it uh, sometimes later. We need to come to an end. One final question, because we didn't mention China at all. I'm, I'm sure you're against... <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. We, we, we can do this in 10 seconds. Uh, I'm sure you're against uh, Huawei uh, becoming part of the 5G network in, in Germany. You're, you're against it. Are you also against uh, American technology? I mean, uh, when it comes to Cisco, which is Huawei's uh, uh, opponent uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the market, we know through Snowden that the NSA is building in back doors. So are you against not only Huawei, but also the American See, technology? See, that's why, that's why I'm such a fan, despite all the, 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 the ifs and buts of Macron's idea for European sovereignty. I don't use European sovereignty in the way, you know, as to decouple Europe from the United States. That's not my point. But I think we should have European technology that would uh, be able to equip a 5G network, Ericsson, Nokia. But I think they're not there that yet. And so the, the, the decision that we have to take eventually is to either buy American or Chinese uh, hardware, but the, and then the BSE. But both of them should, could surveil us. Yes, you're right. And then, frankly speaking, um, I'm more comfortable with Cisco than Huawei. Well, <laughs> Alexander, thank you so much. Um, it thank you. went a little long. I'm sorry. I will, I will take the blame. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.